it was very much stressed that we were going to engage an enemy that was moving fast and we were going to have to shoot accurately and keep shooting. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. This is Radio Bucharest, Romania. Listeners following by great popular manifestations in the capital city of Romania, Bucharest, and all over the country. Today, December 22nd, 1989, the dictatorial regime of Nicolae Ceausescu was overthrown. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 38 of Cold War Conversations. Today we are talking to Neil Gussman, who trained on the M60A1 tank in the 1970s. This was the standard main battle tank of the US Army from the 1960s through to the 1980s. If you're enjoying these podcasts, you can get exclusive extras, including previews of future episodes and content that didn't make the final cut. This is available for as little as a monthly donation of a euro, a dollar or a quid. However, larger amounts and other currencies are accepted too. just head over to coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option. Thank you very much to those listeners who are already supporting us. Back to today's episode, Neil shares with us some great anecdotes about his training and the gunnery competitions he was involved in, as well as the change in US tank tactics as a result of the learnings from the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. I'm delighted to welcome Neil Gussman. In America, the Vietnam War is very much part of the Cold War, as is, you know, the Korean War, the conflict in Grenada, they all work in. So when I enlisted during uh, the time that America had a draft, just three years before the draft ended, but I enlisted um, from a, a suburb just north of Boston. And if you know anything about American, the way Americans serve, two thirds or nearly two thirds of the military is from the 11 states of the old Confederacy and a few states in the West. So people don't serve as much from the, particularly the Northeastern states and during Vietnam, not at all. So I graduated in 1971 from Stoneham High School and there were a, there were 371 kids who graduated and there were two of us who served during the Vietnam War um and in some southern high schools half the boys served during Vietnam so anyway we were uh quite unusual so Murray Hubbard the other kid he enlisted went to Vietnam and came back home perfectly healthy Um, I enlisted in the Air Force, never got closer to Vietnam than Utah, but I came home in bandages because I did live fire missile testing and one of the tests went bad. So, uh, yes, but that that's how I began my military service. All right. okay. And as a result of that accident with the missile testing, you left the the military for a while, didn't you? I did. I left for a year and uh, and I tried being a civilian and I missed the military. So I I went to go back in and the re-enlisting in the Air Force, um, I would have been an airman again. And re-enlisting in the Army, they made me a specialist one grade higher and gave me a $2,500 bonus, you know, which was an awful lot of money. So in 1975, I re-enlisted to be an armor crewman and went to Fort Knox, Kentucky for tank training. Okay. Okay. And 
what what was that training like? What did that entail? Well, we were, uh, it, it's a little over two months of training. Um, as it happened, just because of when I enlisted, I went to Fort Knox in, I was there in July and August. So uh, a lot of the training was hands-on uh, inside the turret of a tank. And it, it was, um, I guess, 33 Celsius, 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Wow. Outside. And then there, there were 10, <laughs> 10 of us crammed in the turret of an M60A1 sometimes. I, I remember that because one of our drill instructors was a large man who had married a wife in Korea who cooked with kimchi, uh, used a lot of garlic. And he said, he said, you're... <laughs> He said, every night I have beer and kimchi and you're not going to fall asleep in my classes. Get in here. <laughs> wow. I mean, 10, 10 in a turret. I can't imagine you can move yeah. in that. Oh, you can't. Um, yes, but there were various things he had to tell us by showing us. So, um, you know, without ammunition, and I, I've been in other tanks, without ammunition in it, um, the M60A1 is a roomier turret than many other tanks. So, you know, we, we didn't have any ammo in the ready rack, of course, because we were training in Fort Knox. And, and um, you know, back then all 19-year-olds were skinny, so uh, you could cram a lot of sweaty people into a turret at Fort Knox. And we learned our various lessons of the uh, of, of different parts of the turret of that tank. Right. And the, the M60A1 was the main battle tank of the U.S. Army in the 1970s. I understand it was it came from sort of like a 1960s des design. Is that correct? Yeah, it came from um, the M48A5, well, the M48, um, and to the M60 itself, which was a a variant, a small variant. There weren't that many of them made. And then uh, the M60A1 had a different turret. And that continued through the entire run of the M60 series. It went to the A3, and there were some odd variants like the A2. But yes, the main battle tank of America was the M60A1, until it was briefly replaced by the A3. And then, of course, America switched over to the M1 Abrams. Yeah. So it really was the, the main, main battle tank of the U.S. Army during the Cold War, I guess. Oh, sure. Through the 60s and into the 80s. Um, as it turns out, I was on active duty until November of 79. And then I, I had another gap in service till 82 i spent a couple of years in an army reserve tank unit in uh, reading pennsylvania now by that time uh the active duty was all on m60a3s but of course this was a reserve unit it had a1s so all of my tank service was on an m60a1 in germany and america and at the time the base we trained on in pennsylvania there were there was a National Guard tank unit, and it still had M48s. Wow. Uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, and and back then, you know, I ended my service recently, 2007 to 16, by being in a National Guard unit, which is <clears throat> it's a lot. The National Guard is taken is looked at a lot better than it used to be during Vietnam. During Vietnam, the National Guard was only barely part of the military. It was a place to go to hide from Vietnam service if you couldn't dodge the draft. Right, right. And so, sorry, just going back to the M60A1, what did the crews think of them? How how did you rate it as a as a tank? Well, as a tank, I mean, every, every crew, um, <clears throat> every crew when they come into tanks, because we're all just young men that, um, come into them, you know, there's, you realize that a tank is the most maintenance intensive vehicle you will ever ride in. 
So if you're an armor crewman, um, you spend all of your time or so much of your time tightening things that get loose and fixing things that break that you just think, I mean, how are we ever going to fight in this? And yet the the war record of the M60A1, not with America, of course, but particularly in the 73 war, is that it's a really reliable tank. And the the drivetrain in particular is very reliable. Uh, the Israeli army, from what I've read, took some captured Soviet vehicles and put uh, American-made engines and transmissions in them and tracks because from a maintenance standpoint, they were so much better than the Soviet yeah. alternative. So yes, from the tanks look so different from the inside than they do from the outside. Um, you know, from the ins from the outside, they're terrifying, but from the inside, they're endless maintenance. Yeah. I mean, I, I have been inside, um, a chieftain turret and that was quite interesting just getting the the feel for that but it did seem quite a large turret certainly compared with what i'd seen of a world war ii tank oh yeah and if uh, and a soviet tank i mean that they how much they sacrificed for having a lower profile tank um you know that it's so cramped in soviet tanks i mean relatively yeah <clears throat> no but it's um but that's yeah so the the focus of of what we did you know particularly in germany where we were training over long distances with reforger you know they load the tanks on trains but still you were driving and when you drive a tank it's got um 80 track blocks 80 center guides 319 or 20 uh, end connectors, yeah. you know, that hold the track together and, um, wheels and all kinds of things that shake and rattle and get loose. And, and so that, that, you know, one of, one of the main jobs, I guess, is, is the maintenance of, of the vehicle and just keeping it, keeping it running because basically your survival depends on it being able to be mobile. Yes. Yes. So automotive maintenance every, at every halt, um, you know whether we were tactical or not we would um we would jump out and start checking end connectors checking um all the things that that got loose and um you know making sure oil levels were right uh and then because we were in germany for a lot of my time making sure um you know to wipe guns off because it was the humidity was somewhere around 98 percent or it was just plain raining um yeah so yeah there were so many things that we we just were making sure they weren't rusting they weren't falling apart yeah yeah so you were an automotive maintenance specialist no matter what the heck you did in that tank right and so obviously the the other key area is the gunnery training can you tell me something about that well, um, that was the <clears throat> that was the focus of our training, and you know, being able to fire that gun accurately and quickly was was what we trained for. That once a year on active duty, and even in in the reserves, it was the same thing. You know, annual gunnery was the the big final exam for the year for tank crews. So uh, you trained for that. And focused on that, and then um, the honor was real. It was uh, it wasn't equivocal like so many other things, you know, where you have a competition and people didn't care that much. Even even people who were you know draftees and just serving their time, they wanted to do well at gunnery before they turned their back on the right. army. And and the gunnery training was that that was in stationary on the move various different types like that oh yes the um so we you know it 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 increased in levels now i want to emphasize that the back then on an m60a1 there were there were no electronic assists at all everything was mechanical we had a device to the when the gunner was sitting in the gunner's seat uh, there was a, a white 
box immediately to the right of his, um, his, where he sits on his right forearm. It was called a computer, but it was a, it was a metal box that had three cams in it. So you would switch from the three different types of rounds to super elevate the gun, to raise, to raise the gun to the necessary height for the distance to get the, the round on mm -hmm. target. But yes, we were, it was in, everything was mechanical. There was, computers were not part of what we did. So, um, yeah, so we were training with, uh, to shoot on the move. I mean, in the sense that we would move from target to target, but then stop and fire. And to be proficient at seeing a target, stopping, firing, and then moving on and picking up the next target. So Right. So so you weren't able to fire whilst the tank was in motion. You had to be stationary in order to aim it accurately. Yes. Accurate fire required you to be stationary. And that's what we trained for was uh, to, to put accurate fire on the target. So we would um, – driver stop was always part of a fire command. Right. Now with a, with a machine gun that wasn't the same, but but with the main gun you stopped, shot, and kept going because there was no way to put accurate fire on a target if <laughs> if you could have you know run over a hump in the ground or fallen in a ditch or anything like that. Yeah, because you see those modern tanks where the barrels remaining sort of targeted whilst the tank is moving, but that's all the uh, fancy modern technology that's doing that. Yeah, and I actually, you know, got a test run in one of those, the M60A3 tanks before I left active duty with a stabilized gun. And yeah, it was crazy that you could drive down the road and whatever the tank did, the gun stayed on target. And, and it also put in the super elevation and yeah, it was just amazing to... Thing, you know, at the time, because computers were so new, but that they had developed that they had developed a computer that could stabilize a gun for a tank that was going 15 miles an hour, for instance. Yeah. Because when I when I was in just to say a com there was a job in the artillery called computer. They were six guys who sat in an M557 um, vehicle that followed those M109 Paladin uh 155 howitzers mm -hmm. and they they computed the um they computed the range and all the the range and the azimuth and everything necessary to put an artillery round on target but that was uh you know <laughs> people who did math yeah yeah and probably with a slide rule or something like that yeah yeah they actually had some rudimentary computers by the time i was in but yeah, they had they had actual math backup. Yeah, it's a bit like when you see that movie Apollo thirteen and their um, exactly. the technology they're dealing with there. Yeah, and that the job title was computer. Yeah. So those, yeah. So there were guys in uh, in army uniforms whose job was computer. Wow. And yeah. um, so how many? What was your expected rate of fire? that you were supposed to be, you know, reach in terms of proficiency? Oh, two rounds in five seconds. So, but the rate of fire, I mean, it was always acquiring that that final exam was you, you acquired a target, uh, hit the, or fired at the target, you were given two rounds and then moved on. So, yeah, so your rate of fire was be ready, stop the tank, shoot, and then put the second round on in, within five seconds. Right. And then keep going. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. And as far as tactics ag against, obviously, the the enemy then was, was the Soviet Union. I mean, w were there extra tactics in terms of, obviously, you want to get to the side of the, or fire in the side of the enemy, because that's normally where the armor is weaker. Were there any sort of tactics like that that were part of your training? Well, uh, since I <clears throat> enlisted in 1975, um, I began serving in the military, in the U.S. military, in the midst of a very big revision in armor doctrine. Um, in 1973, uh, 
I think it was two months after the end of the 73 war, General Don Starry, who was the head of the armor branch, went for what was going to be a short visit to look at the aftermath of that of the uh, battles in the Golan and the Negev. Mm -hmm. And he ended up staying quite a while and going back and bringing his staff and, and then rewriting armor doctrine. Our, um, I guess our training up to that point had assumed we would be primarily engaging at longer ranges and the, what he saw in the Negev and in the Golan said that when the tank battles happened, these modern tanks move faster than um, than their World War II counterparts. Uh, they can engage at longer ranges, but the battles ended up being very rapid and violent, and people were shooting at each other at 100 meters and you know, just blowing the tanks to pieces, so that um, so that the ability to fire accurately and fast got a much. It was very much stressed that we were going to engage an enemy that was moving fast, and we were going to have to shoot accurately and keep shooting. Right. So, and also, I understand from the the Arab Israeli War of seventy three, obviously the um, anti tank missiles were first introduced then and they changed tactics as well oh right that we were yes that the the israelis had been particularly on the egyptian front i mean they were a surprise the suitcase sagger missiles were were a really terrible surprise to the israeli army that um you know one guy with a suitcase looking box could engage a tank at up to three thousand meters and destroy it so Yes, we we had big uh, changes in that we, you had to have suppressive fire on infantry, and yes, that we couldn't presume that you were engaging. You know that the main the main battle would simply be tank on tank. That the battlefield was really dangerous, and you know that any infantryman, maybe at short range with an RPG, and at long range with a Sagger, could could kill the vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think you you mentioned um, the the best day of your eighteen years military service was um, around gunnery training. Is that correct? Oh, it was, and it was because after I finally got out, I started thinking about you know what. Obviously, I had a love hate relationship with the military because I kept uh, since between seventy two and. 2007, I got out several times. Um, in fact, I got out in 1984 and didn't go back until 2007. So I, I would, I would leave and go back and, you know, what was, what was, uh, you know, what was a good day in the army like, since obviously I was happy to leave it at various points. And, and that tank gunnery in 1976, the first time I fired the moving tank range, what um, tankers call table eight. Um, it was the, it was within a year of the, my switch from the air force to the army and with inter service rivalry is, um, is very real between the services. I mean, they, every service insults all of the other services. And the fact that I was air force and uh, because I, I joined the unit in September of 1975, after eight weeks of tank training, I was a specialist. I didn't come in as a private. So by rank, I was assigned as a gunner. Mm -hmm. um, usually the progression is you, you're a driver and then a loader and then a gunner and then you're a tank commander. But, um, you know, this was the end of the draft and they were short of people. So... I had the rank, so they put me in the gunner seat um, with an old tank commander um, so he could teach me about the tank and get me ready to be a tank commander. Um, and uh, uh, this old guy, um, you know, was grumpy and just waiting for retirement, but he was a good teacher. And I learned a lot about gunnery. 
Uh, but the only range I fired on was the stationary range where you line up a tank company, 17 tanks um, side by side, fender to fender, and fire at stationary targets just to get ready for annual gunnery. So in February, before gunnery, I got promoted to sergeant. I got my own crew. And I really wanted to do well. You know, the Air Force guy, the as they referred to me, without poor letter words, the wingnut. Um, you know, I wanted to be the wingnut who fired distinguished. So I actually read the operator's manual of that tank. Um, I was obsessed with it. So the 700-page manual, um, the manual number is 92350215-10. Um yeah, <laughs> I was so I read the entire manual so nothing would go yeah. wrong that I had within my control, and I just drilled my crew. You know, when other crews got off, I would take my crew and drill them in the manual of uh, getting ready, particularly the gunner. So we trained and trained and um, went to that. Table 8 Gunnery in the desert of Fort Carson, Colorado, um, the most practiced crew. And uh, my gunner at the time was one of those draftees who just wanted to leave the military. His, I don't remember what his first name was because everybody called him Merck. He, he could run really fast, so he was Mercury Morris. <laughs> and he was a, a specialist. and. Um, well, the names that we usually used for him, I don't know if you have um, if you have four letter word restrictions in your podcast, but he was he never ironed his uniform in a day when soldiers starched their uh, green uniforms. Um, he was always wrinkled and in everything about being a soldier, he was a mess, but he was a really good gunner. Right. And so Merck and I trained and trained on moving targets, on stationary targets, and he was getting out two months after this gunnery was over. And uh, even though he hated the Army, he decided that he would, you know, try to fire Distinguished. And I got him to believe that if if he could fire Distinguished with a wingnut tank commander, that that would be really like lifting his middle fingers to the Army and saying, see, you don't have to iron your clothes to be good at this. So <laughs> that's yes. And go on. Yeah. And we did. Yes, we did that. Um, the, the table eight gunnery, um, we went through the entire engagement. And one of the great things about Merck is he had, he was a smart kid and he could do the math in his head to use the telescopic site. He, um, we had to do one engagement with the telescope, and I just called a range to him. And with a normal computer, I would set the range in the stereoscopic rangefinder at the top of the turret, and he would just have to put the crosshairs on target. But with that telescopic site, I gave him a range and he had to put the correct crosshair on target and adjust if there wasn't a range line, you know, with the, with the number mm -hmm. I gave him and he could do that. He was really comfortable with the telescopic sight. So a lot of times when people missed, they missed with the telescope and Merck was good with that. And he was also good with, we had to fire the longest shot at nearly 2,000 meters was with um, the high explosive plastic, the, uh, the high explosive round, which was the slowest round we shot. So it was, a, it was a long shot on a high arc. And he hit that target with the first round. And um, that was near the end. And, and when he hit that, I knew we, were, yeah. we had it because he had hit everything yeah. else. And usually, like with Sabo rounds, those armor-piercing rounds, they're, the muzzle velocity is 5,300 feet per second. You can just barely see them. You know, as soon as you blink, they're yeah. through the target. But that HEP round, I watched that for a few seconds go way up in the air 
and go right through right. that and panel. Was, was he the gunner you took with you yeah. to West Germany? Absolutely not. He, he, no, he got he got out two months later, and um, yes, turned his back on the army, and was nobody was happier to leave the army than yeah. him. Yeah, he he he'd done his uh, one finger up at the army, and that was it. <laughs> that was it. Yes, he uh, and he was he was genuinely delighted. He'd never fired distinguished before, and. You know, he was arguably our, our our platoon sergeant. It was a sergeant first class type. Um, you know, he was the other reason that uh, that I could shoot that well, because he had been a tanker since before Vietnam. He'd been a tanker in Vietnam, and he was also a master gunner. So he knew all of the variables that uh, you could control for to get that gun to shoot accurately. When we zeroed the gun, uh, we shot at a, a thousand meter panel, and we had three rounds. And there, there's a two foot circle in the middle of it. And you know, because the preparation was so good with Sergeant Stipe, um, the first three rounds we didn't have to do any more. We put three rounds in a two foot circle, and we were ready to shoot. So, wow. yes. So, so yeah, so we had, um, so going into this gunnery, I was in the platoon of the best platoon sergeant. I had the guy who I thought was the best gunner. So I was, I was really ready and yeah, I, yeah. So I, I trained for it and, um, yes. So my first gunnery out, I fired distinguished, which is you hit, um, it all but one, um, or all of the targets, but you hit at least 95% of the targets and it puts you in the top 10% of the battalion or the division, depending on which unit you're in. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and so you progress, so you're, you're tank commander. Um, now yeah. I'm familiar with sort of like world war two, where the tank commander is looking out of the turret um, in a M 60 a one. Is it all buttoned down when you're in action? No, I mean we we train to do uh, we train to do operations with the hatches closed, but routinely no. We had our heads out. Um, at least I did. Uh, the The best way to adjust fire was to have your head out. Um, if you were looking out through gun slits, watching us the sabo round, the armor piercing round go down range, it it, it was hard to see. <laughs> It was hard to see that rain that that tracer go down range even even in the most clear circumstances. So yeah, so when we had the option, and certainly on any training exercise, we had the hatches open. Well, that's all we had time for, but that's not the end of Neil's story. We have a further episode coming soon where Neil talks about his deployment to West Germany, including a nervy incident on the inner German border. Don't miss that. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode, which includes some photos of Neil and some interesting videos of the M60A1 tank. The show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 38. If you like what you are listening to, do join our Facebook discussion group where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with listeners and guests. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. And we're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod. And our newest social media account is on Instagram at Cold War Conversations. Lastly, if you like what you're hearing, do leave reviews with your podcast provider and share us via social media. It really helps to increase awareness of the podcast. I'd like to thank our recent reviewers, including Chris Millington UK. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the podcast. It is much appreciated. Goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. 